Welcome That's back good. everyone to theCUBE studio here in Palo Alto. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. I'm here with Dave Vellante and a, and a great lineup of leaders. This is the Silicon Valley AI Infrastructure Leaders Program hosted by theCUBE and the NYSE Wired community. Raj Evakars here is the CTO of Juniper Networks. He is a leader, I've interviewed many times, um, and Juniper Networks obviously setting the agenda for Gen AI and certainly AI native networking, which is part of now all the integrated systems. Raj, great to see you and then have you on this inaugural program. Thank you, thank you, John. Thanks for having me. It's a really cool community vibe. We got a lot of leaders coming together, sharing, you know, what's going on in the industry, not about their, just their companies they're involved in, but what they're doing and what they're seeing, sharing their perspective, uh, inspiring, and there's a lot of problems to solve. So if you're an engineer, it's a great time to be in this market. If you're an entrepreneur, there's tons of opportunities, Raj. And this is a special moment in, in, in Silicon Valley and in the industry because there is so much going on and, and it's in the fun part of the network. It's the network, it's the infrastructure, it's the chips and all the action is in areas that felt, I won't say dormant. I mean, go back 10 years, the VC market wasn't that robust with semiconductors. You know, now it, it's all the rage, but it's not just chips, it's what's around it. And you guys have been leading the charge. So what's your perspective as you look at the market? What's so exciting part about, it? what do you see? So I think if you're a networking geek, uh, it is a, an exciting place to be because everybody's building a huge GPU clusters, all of those clusters need to be fed data from storage networks. Then once you have data in, you need to have data transferred between the GPUs. So networking is needed, no matter what. Very high performance, uh, high throughput, low latency kind of network. So that's being built. More exciting part is that a lot of the infrastructure is not just being built in hyperscalers. It's also being built by enterprises on-prem, which is a big shift in the market from what we have seen, uh, everything shifting to cloud kind of a market. And that is for a variety of reasons. Cost, uh, data privacy, data sovereignty. In terms of cost, people have shown, the SCG research recently showed that cost of doing machine learning training on-prem is about half of uh, it cost uh, in the cloud. So there are good reasons to build this infrastructure on-prem. And as a networking company, we were fortunate to have been thinking about AI for the last four or five years. So we, we built what you yeah. call AI native networking platform. Our infrastructure we're building, 800 gig switches and all, are complemented by our intent-based automation, we call it abstract-based automation, to support congestion management, flow control, and so on, so that we can automate uh, the operations of the network, either it's front-end network or back-end network, does not matter. The uh, in industry has seen this next generation cloud. You kind of pointed it out. When the SaaS wave hit, well, first of all, the dot-com happened, iPhone happened, apps came out. We saw that right out of the gate. You know, when Facebook came out, people were throwing sheep, it's application, you know, Farmville. And then it settled in, the apps got better and more hardened. Gen AI has got that same kind of feel. The apps are, they're not as you know silly as some of the social networks or some of the gaming apps on the iPhone, but they're, kind of experimental, they're fast to stand up, some are more durable than others, but you start to see more and more use cases of new right. kinds of applications. And so what's happening is we're seeing a, a wave one of apps that can sit on the network. They don't need a lot of power because they don't really have a large scale, but now you're starting to see scale become a factor. That's, that's going to right. separate the wheat from the shaft, so, so to speak. And that's kind of what you and I were talking about last time is that yeah. enterprises aren't just some server handling a thousand users, right? <laughs> They're, they got a lot going on, scale matters. Right. Can you share your thoughts on how, why the infrastructure really needs to be ready for the scale? So I think scale matters because people are building GPU clusters of sizes of anywhere from 64 GPUs to 1000, 10,000 GPUs. When you bring that kind of a scale, you need to have networking that scales too. So for one of the first things we did, we were first ones to introduce 800 gig switches. You need that kind of capacity. You need to build leaf spine networks, super spine networks. And for that sort of scale, uh, you need to uh, uh, keep in mind that the clusters at the scale, the tail latency, for example, cannot exceed at the mean latency by more than a factor of two or something like that. Which means now you are providing a large scale networking, not just for high throughput, but also congestion free. So that's why providing non-blocking 
congestion management, load balancing, flow control is important. And that's what we are doing right now. Raj, I want you to share with the, the audience who are look, watching, um, and we talked a little bit about this, that you just had an event on the next gen AIs coming, networking. You know, storage, networking, and compute, and now you have GPUs, XPU, all kinds of devices to, to process. The roles are changing because of Genevieve. Can you share your vision on, and specifics on how you see, you know, storage, networking, and compute change based upon the conditions and the situations that Genevieve AI will have? For example, training might require more reads and, than writes, or write more writes than reads. Inference does things differently. You're seeing characteristics that sound a lot like policy-based stuff, but it's not, it's real-time generative. This is kind of putting pressure on what the table stakes will be in the, in, in the enterprise, the key building blocks. That's, that's an excellent point. There are multiple factors here. First is, as you said, training workloads, the traffic characterization is different. Then there's the inferencing workload, which is more latency sensitive. So it's not so much as traffic, but the latency matters. Then traditionally the compute storage networking network were built as separate networks. Storage used the infinite band as networking technology. Compute used general purpose ethernet. What's happening with GPU based clusters, these things are coming together. And the standard ethernet is, we are being able to show is not just good enough, it performs as well or better than infinite band based networks. And that is being recognized by industry now by creating this ultra ethernet consortium. It's a consortium of all the vendors trying to evolve ethernet standard to add some new capabilities to match the training workloads and inferencing workloads. I, I put out a research report and this came a lot of the work that you guys are doing as well as Broadcom and some other leaders. The shift from InfiniBand to ethernet and networking, parity of performance, enterprise adoption, scalability and flexibility and cloud integration. These were the, were the drivers, but the challenges that the, in the data center is how do you feed all these accelerators? What's the data security posture? Data management at scale. And then the pitfalls that people fall into just on misconfigurating things. Yeah. That is, these are big challenges. And if you can crack the code on them, there's huge opportunities. What's your reaction to that? So I think uh, you said it well, right? Misconfiguration is a big problem, especially as you build scalable uh, clusters. And also understanding uh, not just configuration, but the operational uh, or it. Yeah, like you said earlier, you need to change the characterization or characteristics of network based on workloads. So what we have done is we introduced what you call auto tuning application. What that application does is, it's like uh, applying artificial intelligence to the operation of the AI network itself. So you constantly monitor the network, observe what the configurations are. For example, in a switch, if you have set the uh, packet buffer thresholds for marking, say, congestion notifications, and you set it too high, and you wait too long, then the intelligence will increase. By observing this across the entire fabric, we change the configurations on the fly. We change the thresholds, parameters on the fly. That's what we mean by auto-tuning application. Yeah. So that's an example of applying AI for the operation of AI networking. And that's what we mean by- And auto-tuning, auto-tuning as you call it, is that human involved? Is that done by the, the software? No, completely automated using uh, uh, intent-based automation that we have in our Upstar Networks product. But and there's enough data you keep on collecting as a time series data so you can apply it continuously. Yeah, this is what I love about this market right now because I mean, you go back to old school networking, obviously, you know, been there, done that, you've done, built, you know, built the, the, the companies there. Policy-based stuff was super important in networking because of the, the impact of wrong routes or wrong path costs. I mean, that was simpler then I mean, compared to what it is now, but it still matters. And now you take that at scale, it's not policy, it's just, it's intelligence. So. How does networking become more intelligent? And then how does that intelligence work with the other subsystems, the other key um, building blocks like compute and storage, and right. even high, high bandwidth memory? And because you have a lot going on around the, this new system architecture. That's right. So I think one good news is that you have a lot of telemetry available out of GPUs, out of compute, out of storage. If you start, and networking also. If you start taking all of that telemetry and start building models, machine learning models that know how to correlate across these different components. So we call it application aware assurance. You start collecting telemetry from application, mm -hmm. from compute, GPU, networking, 
operating systems, and you start correlating using machine learning model. If you do that, now you can start finding out where the problem is because you can find the anomalies. You find the switch buffers are running out of space. You find the packet loss has increased, latency has spiked. Based on that, you can point out where the problem is, yeah. and then you can do automated root cause diagnostics. Once you do that, the next step is automated remediation to the extent possible or to the extent network operators are comfortable somebody doing it. Because many times you tell them, this is the problem and they can fix it or we can fix it ourselves. Root cause analysis. I mean, a lot of companies are talking about that in the news lately and this is disruption. This is bad disruption. It's not good disruption. Disruptive in a good way is like change the game for the better, but having a network that downs means you're offline, right? You got to yeah. have that ability. Uh, I also want to get your thoughts on, on um, the enterprise architecture. We have two use cases we've been pushing out in theCUBE um, in terms of end user, Uber, which we've featured on theCUBE, their engineering team has come in and talked with us, shared their environment. They built that from scratch because they had to, and, and they had to deal with the first ever data lake that was built, and their system is awesome. Then you got a company we just interviewed um, here, a TransUnion, they're a legacy company which rewrote everything, and the two things in common is one was kind of built from scratch, from the ground up, so it was engineered with all the engineers. The other one was a legacy company that was re-engineered by engineers. So again, keyword engineers. Right. They have end-to-end -end workloads and the benefit that they're seeing now with generative AI across the board is that they do have the end-to-end -end workloads. What is your thoughts on this? Because we're seeing this as a major trend. If you have end-to-end -end visibility into the workloads, you can then have better execution up and down the stack. What, what's your feeling on this? So I like to use the term mean time to innocence. See, any time the workloads are not doing well in any enterprise network, they blame the network. Network is slow, network <laughs> is not working, right? Yeah. So now what you talked about is end-to-end -end visibility across all these layers in the stack, starting from application, compute, GPU, networking, operating system. Now you can start pointing out where the real problem is. So first thing from networking perspective, we want to be able to point out whether the network is a problem or somewhere is the problem. Somewhere else is the problem, then we want to be able to also show where that problem is. Is it in the virtualization layer? Is it in the application layer? And I think that's powerful. Company like uh, Uber you mentioned, they build their own uh, distributed system, infrastructure from the scratch. It's easier for them to do, yeah. because they do health checks, they do monitoring. But I think the traditional companies have to re-engineer or transform their way of thinking about it. They cannot operate in silos of networking, storage, compute, GPU. Now you have to bring them together. Yeah. And that's what I mean by this end-to-end -end application aware assurance. You want to monitor, set service level expectations, yeah. measure your performance continuously against those expectations. The moment performance deviates from those expectations, you immediately flag it, point out where the problem is, and also provide suggestions for fixing those. Raj, that's great insights, like a master class. I want to get your thoughts on some of the key things at the intelligence application layer. Obviously, a lot of stuff's going on in the plumbing. I call it plumbing, but a lot of infrastructure. And then you got the data piece. If you look at the companies right now, most of them are really looking at their strategic intent. Who do I work with? Um, they're, make, they're making a generational decision about who they work with, technologies that they choose. There's a lot of foundational work going on at the infrastructure. That's right. What is your advice? Because there's a lot of decisions being made. In some cases, we just did a survey and shipped it two, two days ago uh, in Generative AI and the data on our SuperCloud 7 that showed that in the Snowflake kind of data area, 96% of the decisions being made are being made by platform engineers. Engineers, okay? that's right. Not data scientists or business workload, line of business. So you're seeing a shift to platformization. What, people have to make a generational bet. What's your advice to, to, to the industry on how to do that? What are some of the criteria that you would go through? So the most important bet I advise people to make is in an open ecosystem. It's very easy to find a short path and get a proprietary vertically integrated system where everything comes from one vendor. It makes it easier for it's a single neck to choke. But that's a mistake because the things are evolving fast. We don't have single large language model, multiple LLMs have come in. Open source models like Llama 2, Llama 3 are as good as closed systems, right? Mm -hmm. So you need to look at all of the stack and how you can get the best of breed parts, components from any vendor by 
investing in an open ecosystem based on open standards. So networking point of view, that's why we push Ethernet. Yeah. Ethernet has outlasted any other technology in the last 30 years, right? 40 yeah. years. Ethernet wins. And it will continue to evolve. Same thing you go next layer. If you go to the PyTorch like frameworks, you want to use those frameworks which are open uh, so that you, you are not locked into a single vendor's ecosystem. Yeah. That's the most important advice I give. Okay, Raj, final question. The fun one, this is a fun one for us. You and I are dorm room mates in college and we're you know, 23 years old, we're going to graduate, but we're super smart. Uh, we know what we know now. What are we building? We're a startup. What opportunity would we look at and go after and start a company? Because there's so much opportunity recognition going on right now and the capture equation shifted. Obviously, if you're in your 20s, you had a little more free time, not a lot of, a lot of responsibility. What would we go after? I mean, what, what I would think be like a sweet spot? Where's the big white space? I think the big white space is outside the infrastructure. It is in the applying generative AI for vertical use cases like HR, legal, finance, go to market, accounting. All of these functions have lots of workflows which are manually driven or they're outsourced to a low cost countries like India. Those can be now performed by generative AI. So you have a white space there to build these vertical use cases as applications, SaaS applications or on-prem applications that will increase the productivity of these functions by 20, 30, 40%. That's a big opportunity and that's the next wave. Raj, I'll get, oh, I'll, get, I'll get the AI to write our PowerPoint demo, actually code the prototype and we'll, I, got, I know some VCs that will fund us, I think. That's, I hope. <laughs> Raj, thank you so much and, and, and we'll see you soon. And thank you for spending the time out of your busy schedule to be part of this inaugural Silicon Valley AI Infrastructure Leaders Program. Great group of, of great people, uh, experts sharing their advice and opinion, of course, talking about what they're working on. And you know, thank you so much for taking the time. No, thanks for the opportunity. It's always a pleasure. Okay, Raj, CTO at Juniper Networks. They're doing some killer work there on some next gen networking, AI for networking, networking for AI. The network has always been that last area that we've been waiting to innovate. It's happening and, and continuing to evolve and being a key part of the new chip design systems, clustered systems, compute networking storage, all magically working together with all kinds of stuff around it. Juniper Networks leading the way. I'm John Furrier here in theCUBE. Silicon Valley's AI infrastructure leaders are here. We'll be back with more after this short break. <music>